Men take to the streets. They have burned their hijabs and cut off their hair in public. They have gathered in squares all over the country, joined by men and women from across Iranian society. They are protesting because last week, Iranian thugs who call themselves the morality police beat a 22-year-old woman to death for not properly wearing her hijab. Another tragic incident in a long record of repression. According to news reports, the government has responded with violence, tear gas, mass arrests, and live gunfire, injuring and killing protesters. A brutal response from a brutal autocratic regime that enforces structural misogyny and fears the power of these brave women's voices. This committee stands in solidarity with them in their struggle for freedom and liberty. And so, Ms. Hakiem, is that, is, that, is that the right pronunciation? Hakiem? Hakakian. Hakakian, Hakakian. Ms. Hakakian, Ms. Ilham, and Ms. Paya, thank you for coming before our committee today to tell us your stories and talk about the incredible efforts that women are leading across the world against authoritarian regimes. Every year for the last 16 years, more countries have moved away from democracy than towards it, according to the Freedom House Index. Many commentators like to say that globally democracy is backsliding, that autocrats have the upper hand and the champions of democracy are on their back foot. I believe they are wrong. Wrong because you and women like you across the globe are prepared to defend the universal values of liberty and human dignity. Now, as you know too well, the threat from rulers like those in Tehran, like Vladimir Putin, like Xi Jinping and other autocrats is not only dangerous, it can be deadly. These men repress their citizens with brute force, imprisoning activists and average citizens alike. But women human rights defenders face particular risks because their advocacy is seen as a threat to the status quo. That's why the Supreme Leader and President of Iran's security forces are killing protesters in the street. It's why in Saudi Arabia, women still need a man's approval to marry. In Latin America, a wave of femicides has gone unanswered. In Afghanistan, the Taliban are quickly erasing women from the public sphere. And in China, the government has sent ethnic minority Uyghurs into concentration camps, forcing Uyghur women onto birth control, forcing them to have abortions, even forcing them to be sterilized. Killings and attacks against women human rights defenders are on the rise all over. More than 40 women human rights defenders were murdered in 2019 alone. And the United Nations has received more than 180 reports of abuse against human, women human rights defenders across 60 countries. It is no coincidence that the global attack on democracy has occurred in lockstep with this assault on women's rights. Autocrats fear the fight for women's political and economic inclusion because it has mobilized democratic transitions away from authoritarianism. And these regimes will do whatever it takes to keep their hold on power. Their security services certainly don't confine their repression within international borders. They harass, surveil, kidnap, and even kill women who live in diaspora communities abroad. Sometimes even here in the United States, as some of our witnesses know firsthand. It is the duty of those of us fighting for democracy to support and defend the women who are on the front lines of this struggle. That's why I've authored bipartisan legislation like the Sanctioning Supporters of Slave Labor Act, which would expand sanctions on those committing human rights abuses against the Uyghur population. Because too often attacks against women are attacks against democracy, and we must hold the perpetrators accountable. But we all have to do more. International institutions need to do more. The United States needs to do more. Congress needs to do more. And I hope our witnesses today can tell us where the US and the Biden administration could be doing more. What are we missing when we try to address this critical challenge? How can we best support women who are taking the lead in countering authoritarian regimes? 
And finally, I want to express my deep respect for the witnesses here today. Ms. Paya is a great admirer of your father's courage in the face of a brutal Cuban regime. And while it has been 10 years since his murder, I know that we stand with you, fighting for transparency and accountability for those who killed him and tried to cover it up. Just as we stand with Ms. Ilham and Ms. Hakiem in your fight for freedom and justice. With that, let me turn to the ranking member for his opening remarks, Senator Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this very important hearing and for your strong statement you just made uh, with regard to what is happening on the streets of Iran today following the death of Masha Amini at the hands of the morality police. Uh, I look forward to talking more about that um, with um, our witnesses. According to global democracy indices, countries like Russia, China, Iran, Cuba, and others are exporting their authoritarian models of government to other countries and eroding democracies around the world. We've certainly seen this uh, attempt in Ukraine. They're doing it to undermine these democratic countries and the freedoms uh, that they find offensive, um, but also to strengthen their own countries. And as these authoritarian countries continue to oppress their citizens, it is often the women in those countries who suffer the greatest, as our witnesses will tell us today. It's evident we are at a critical point where democracies all around the world are being tested. And the United States has a duty to continue to lead, to ensure that those who are speaking out against authoritarian regimes know that we have their back. They have our support. Before us today, we have three brave women who have courageously stood up to speak out against the repressive regimes in their home countries. Many of them have done this at great risk to themselves, to their families, to their friends. It can be difficult for Americans to comprehend what you have gone through. In the United States, we often take our freedoms for granted. So the thought that someone would need to risk her life just to advocate for the basic rights that we enjoy here is a foreign concept to many of us. Our first witness is Rosa Maria Paya Acevedo. After her father's death in 2012, which was widely suspected to be the work of the Cuban government, Ms. Paya started Cuba Decide a grassroots organization to promote true democracy in Cuba. With her organization, she has carried the torch of liberty from her father to advocate for real democratic reform in a country that has not known democracy in decades. Before us today, we also have Jehar Ilham, a Uyghur rights champion and passionate advocate against forced labor. In 2013, Ms. Ilham was forced to watch her father be arrested and taken away by Chinese authorities in front of her. He was then given a life sentence on trumped up charges and Ms. Ilham has dedicated her life since then to advocating for the rights of the Uyghur people. At just 28 years old, she testified before the UN General Assembly, has been published and quoted in numerous international media outlets. And in 2019, she delivered the keynote address at the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom. Finally, we have Roya Hakakian, an Iranian-American poet and strong advocate for the rights of the Iranian people. For 43 years, Iran has been under the oppressive rule of the mullahs who have consistently obstructed and denied the people's basic rights, including freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and of course, the right to choose their own leaders in a fair democratic process. Ms. Akakian has been such an advocate uh, for these rights, and she has even been targeted for it by the Iranian government operatives here in the United States. Again, I'd like to thank these brave witnesses for being willing to discuss the important work they're doing on this issue. And we look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Portman. So let me introduce our panel, uh, Ms. Rosa Maria Paya, a Cuban democracy leader and activist. Ms. Paya uh, serves as the president of the Latin American Network of Youth for Democracy and founder of the Cuba Decides campaign. She is a woman from a family which has been permanently scarred by the authoritarian regime in Cuba. Her father, Oswaldo Payat, was killed by the Cuban regime. He was one of Cuba's most courageous and influential political dissenters. We welcome you. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'd like to also introduce uh, Ms. Juhar Ilham. Ms. Ilham is another courageous activist and human rights defender, an author of two books, an advocate for the Uyghur population, and for her father, Uyghur economist Ilham Topi, who is currently unjustly imprisoned by the People's Republic of China, like so many members of the Uyghur community. Ms. Ilham currently works at the Workers' Rights Consortium as Forced Labor Project Coordinator and serves as a spokesperson for the Coalition to End Uyghur Forced Labor. And it is a pleasure to have you here with us. 
Finally, let me introduce Woya Hakakian. Hakakian. Uh, Ms. Hakakian is a poet, a journalist, a writer, an activist. Ms. Hakakian was a founding member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, has served on the Board of Refugees International. She has served as a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, where she is now a permanent member. And as a fellow at the Yale Whitney Humanities Center, thank you for joining us as well. We'll uh, start your testimony. I'd ask you, if, without objection, your full testimony will be included in the record. I'd ask you to try to summarize it in five minutes or so, because as you can see, there are members who are very interested, who would like to engage in a conversation with you. And we'll start off with you, Ms. Payam. Thank you so much, Sherman Menendez. It's a truly honor to be here today. In her book, Sex and the World Peace, Dr. Hudson argues that the status of women is the single most important predictive factor for state stability. In truth, the state terrorism in Cuba affects both men and women, but the status of women in my country is not only a predictive indicator of repression, but also of how the U.S. will fare in terms of its own national security. My name is Rosa Maria Paya from the Citizen Initiative Cuba Decide to move Cuba toward democracy. With thousands on the island, during the last years, we have lived a radical increase in activism and peaceful demonstrations and an equally intense increase in repression. Ten years ago, the Castro brothers ordered the murder of Harold Sepero and my father, Osvaldo Paya a respected civic leader who mobilized thousands of citizens. And if the treatment of women is indeed an indicator, I tell you about the way my mother was treated when she had to leave Cuba because my father murderers harassed my brothers and threatening me with death. And then in 2017, when she returned to visit her husband, Tom, the political police detained and expelled her from her own country with the collaboration of American Airlines. If a woman is a symbol for Cuba, her name is Aileen Navarro. She's 36 years old and is, service, and is serving a sentence of eight years for going to the police station to ask about the disappeared persons from the protests on July 11. But if a woman is Cuba, her name is Aymara Nieto. She has two little girls <clears throat> whom she has not seen grow up because since 2018, she has been in prison for demanding the liberation of the political prisoners. There are more than 1,000 political prisoners in Cuba. That is more than in all Latin American combined. My country is on the brink of a humanitarian tragedy. Mothers cannot feed their children. Why does this matter to Americans? Well, because the world believes that you are a beacon of hope and freedom, but also because it is in your self-interest. In the last 10 months alone, almost the 2% of the Cuban population have crossed the southern border in a coordinated operation between Havana and Managua. The dictatorships and the Cuban dictatorship threaten peace in the continent and provides sanctuaries to terrorists. That is why it's critical to keep Cuba on the list of states sponsors of terrorism. The Cuban regime has a tragic and has, has an strategic and military agreement with Russia. Russia's best transatlantic ally is only 90 miles away. But you, you can end this threat. First, there are the Cuban people. Despite the terror, the humanitarian crisis, and the exodus, protest continues in my country. We Cubans, we are determined to be free. Second, we encourage the administration to stop any attempt of appeasement of the Cuban regime and instead demand the unconditional release of all political prisoners. The end of the repression, the respect in law and in practice of freedom of expression, association, and economic freedom. 
apply individual sanctions, full use of the Global Magnitsky Act, targeting officials and individuals involved in human rights abuses, create an international effort, a coalition of nations, in support of the right to decide of the Cuban people, of a Biden plebiscite so that the Cuban people can decide the change towards democracy peacefully. Lastly, we ask the administration and the Congress to remember that American companies embrace the Sullivan principles to end the South African apartheid. Please request from the companies the same behavior towards the Cuban people. In closing, I'll share a story that you may not know. In 1781, when the Continental Army was depleted, the ladies of Havana donated 1.2 million pounds of silver to the cause. Many said that that donation was the foundation on which the building of democracy was built. The gift came with a letter. This is, so the American mother's sons are not born as slaves. Today, my country is enslaved. And all we are asking is for the US to support the people of Cuba, the women of Cuba, in our just quest for freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Ilham. I'd like to thank Senator Shaheen, Senator Portman, and Chairman Menendez for inviting me to testify today. My name is Johar Ilham. I am a Uyghur rights advocate. And as mentioned earlier, uh, many of you all know me as the daughter of jailed Uyghur economist Ilham Tohti. Nine and a half years ago, as a teenager, I came to the United States all alone after my father was arrested in front of my eyes at the Beijing International Airport. He's now serving a life sentence on charges of separatism as part of a crackdown by the Chinese government on Uyghur descent. I have not seen him since. Now many more Uyghur families have been torn apart. Over the past few years, the Chinese government has been implementing extremely repressive policies in the Uyghur region in the name of countering terrorism and poverty alleviation. The theme today is women leaders countering authoritarianism. And as a woman, I am proud to stand with women everywhere who are combating rights violations in any society. In many places, we're seeing increasing crackdowns on civil society and on human rights defenders who speak up. I want to speak today about women's rights violations in China, namely gender-based sexual violence, coerced marriage, forced sterilization, and forced labor. Did you know that for the Chinese government's so-called ethnic bonding and family pairing programs, Han Chinese officials have been sent to sleep over at Uyghur women's homes while their husbands are locked up in a camp. I do not call that ethnic bonding, which sound like building cross-culture connections. I call that sexual harassment. I have spoken with women who were released from forced labor camps tell telling horrifying stories of sexual abuse and violence. And outside of these camps, some Uyghur women are forcibly wedded to Han Chinese men. Many Uyghur women who are already married are also enduring forced sterilization. The birth rate in the Uyghur region dropped 24% in 2019, while the rest of China, the birth rate was increasing. In another effort to exercise control in the region and to also reap financial benefit from its repressive policies, the Chinese government has arbitrarily detained an estimated 1 million to 1.8 million people and implemented a program to cleanse ethnic groups of their extremist thoughts through re-education and forced labor. And this had had a huge impact on women as they themselves are de detained in torturous conditions or their family members are locked up. The complicity of global corporations in human rights abuses and forced labor in the Uyghur region is well documented. And that is why strong legislative action by Congress became very essential. The Worker Rights Consortium is part of the coalition to end forced labor in the Uyghur region. And now that the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act is in effect, 
We're concerned that corporations that are prevented from importing goods tainted with Uyghur forced labor will dump these goods in other markets. For obvious reasons, if corporations engage in this practice, and if governments tolerate it, this will substantially reduce the economic pressure that the US import ban places on the system of state-sponsored forced labor. That is why the coalition is asking corporations to commit to a single global sourcing standard that excludes inputs from the Uyghur region from any of the goods they sell in any market where they do business. But some companies will not end their reliance on forced labor unless they're required to do so, which is why it is vital for the U.S. to coordinate with governments in other major consumer markets and why it is essential that the EU, UK, and other sh others shoulder their responsibilities. The majority of camp survivors who have publicly testified are women. Many more women could be ready to testify if the U.S. would provide a safe haven for them. Therefore, it is important to ensure expedi expedited refugee status for Uyghurs seeking asylum, especially for those who have faced political persecution, persecution or who can testify to forced labor or gender-based violence. I'd like to close with one more recommendation. The U.S. government needs to constantly call for the immediately, immediate release of Uyghurs who have been imprisoned for no other reason than simply being Uyghur. It would take several hours to list names, so I would simply share the names of three of these women. Retired dentist Gulshan Abbas, well-known anthropologist Rahila Dawood, and my dear cousin Nuralia Yalqun, who was a nurse and now sentenced to, to prison for 10 years for having a photo of my father in her cell phone. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hakakian. Dear senators, ladies and gentlemen, on the program today, I'm identified as a writer and a journalist, but in some ways, immigrant and naturalized US citizen describe me best. I arrived in the US as so many before me have, a refugee having fled tyranny, and religious persecution during the darkest period after Iran's 1979 revolution. Within a few years, all of my family and much of the community in which I had grown up had vanished. Recently, someone sent a photograph of the gravestones of my paternal grandparents in Tehran, and I realized that only these two stones remain of all that I once had and knew. I was a girl when the mandatory dress code, the hijab, became the law. I was a teen when the morality police began making the rounds, stopping and arresting people on a mere whim, sometimes for no more than just a few strands of hair peeking out from under one scarf. One August day in 1984, when the temperature was intolerably high, and the water fountains had been shut in observance of the Ramadan, I, under my thick headscarf and Islamic uniform, began thinking that I would not mind dying if my death would bring the end of those who had made our lives so unbearable. Thirty-some years since, another girl, a little older than I was then, was bludgeoned to death for exposing a few strands of her hair while in the custody of the same morality police. The leaked scans of her head show fractures to her skull. I'm here today not as an aspiring politician hoping to return to power. I've no political ambitions, nor do I have anything to return to in Iran. I'm here because that girl, Mahsa Amini, could have been me. My accidental survival and lucky crossing into this country compel me to speak on her behalf and make sure that you hear her voice and help prevent such future deaths. Since her passing, thousands have taken to the streets in a show of solidarity that is rare even for a country that has known so many tumultuous moments. For nearly 20 years, the US State Department, among other institution, institutions, have spent 
tens of millions of dollars to advance the cause of democracy in Iran. I should know because an organization I helped found, Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, and another on whose board I serve, Tabana, have been recipients of these funds. This investment has been far less than the billions the United States has spent in Iran's two neighboring countries, not to mention the thousands of lives that have been lost there. I can confidently say that, given that the aspiration for a civil society has a 100-year-old root in Iran, that much smaller American investment has paid off. What I wonder about is whether Washington is aware or prepared for this welcome change. The nation that emblazoned the world's memory with humiliating images of blindfolded U.S. diplomats is no longer an enemy. Rather than burn the U.S. flags, Iranian women, the vanguards of the current movement, are burning their headscarves, and the men are there to support them. They're not demanding to eradicate the hijab, but to gain the right to choose. I can't think of two other words that capture the essence of America better than right and choice. Unarmed people are marching the streets no longer chanting death to America, but death to the dictator, blackening the images of the supreme leader on murals and posters. The people who once believed that America, the great Satan, is the source of all evil are now chanting, our enemy is right here, they lie when they say it's America. With the exception of Ukraine, I cannot think of another nation on earth that is, at this very moment, sacrificing more than Iranians are to reach the very ideals upon which the American Republic was built. Those foundational underpinnings, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, with only a minor local twist, is what the demonstrators are chanting now. They are calling for one life, liberty. They have replaced the, the term pursuit of happiness with the word woman because they know that no society can be free or achieve happiness if 50% of its people are treated as second-class citizens. For years, many experts have convinced us that Iran has no viable opposition leader. They fail to see that rather than the old leadership model of a singular figure, nearly always a man representing a people, it's been many, many women who have inspired and moved their compatriots all along. It's women who have most consistently resisted this tyranny and persisted against the widespread myth that the hijab is an Iranian tradition. If nothing else, I hope these valorous Iranians have proven that if any tradition requires heavily armed men defending it 24 hours a day or forces them to bludgeon youth to death either deserves to perish or is simply a tool for, of subjugation the oppressors wish to disguise as tradition. In short, hijab is as much an Iranian tradition as slavery was an American tradition. Iran has reached a Ukrainian moment. It is the moment when a nation realizes that it is willing to pay the price of its own freedom. They're sacrificing their lives for the cause that, however physically distant from Americans, is detrimental both to Iranians and to the safeguarding of the American values for which we stand. They are not asking others to do their fighting for them. All they're asking for is for our support so they can face their heavily armed Goliaths. No nation can ever succeed or has ever succeeded against such powerful adversary. But with our support, Iranians, led by their women, can reach their freedom and help us all lead, live in a safer world. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> we'll start a round of questions. Uh, thank you all for incredibly powerful testimony and for your personal stories. It's not easy uh, to tell and to uh, create the risk that you do for yourselves. So we're deeply in your grat uh, deeply uh, gratified to have your willingness to do that. Uh, let me um, let me start off. Uh, how uh, how does the targeting of women specifically threaten the human rights and democratic freedoms of the broader population? 
What's your perception of that? And it's an open question to any one of you who wish to. Now it's done, right. Uh, women in, in my country have been suffering horrible repression, but they have been also the unstoppable force for freedom. Not only taking care of those that uh, were in jail before, but also advancing the, uh, the cause for human rights, from the women that are independent journalists, from the ladies in white, to the Garrido sisters, which are today in jail because they were protesting on July 11 last year. And yesterday we learned that these two young, brave Cuban, Cuban women, together with another women with another woman which name is Lisandra Gongora started a hunger strike. I want to take just one minute to, to read to you the handwritten note that they managed to smuggle out just to announce their decision. We announced to the world and to Cuba that the political prisoners, Maria Cristina Garrido, Lisandra Gongora, and Angelica Garrido, unjustly in prison, refuse to wear the uniform and will be in hunger strike from now on. We demand our freedom. And if our life depends on our decision to do, let all the justice fall on our oppression, on our oppressors. The Bible will be our pillow and our shelter. We are resistance from this cold shadow. Life cries the king, patria y vida. So I do believe that the Cuban regime is especially harsh against women because they know about that po the power that lies on the Cuban women, and I, I have to say, on the women of our region mm -hmm. that are advancing the cause of freedom. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Alham, and, and while you're answering this question, I have another one for you that you can hopefully conjoin. Uh, in Xinjiang, the Chinese Communist Party is committing a genocide against Uyghur people. It's a targeted campaign, and the Chinese government has subjected, subjected Uyghur women to particularly brutal practices. You have interviewed many Uyghur women who have experienced these horrific abuses. In addition to the broader question, can you share some of that uh, knowledge that you've gleaned from those interviews? How detailed can I share with what's happening to those women? Um, it could be pretty horrifying, all these stories. Can I be pretty forward with that? Not, I think, uh, you know, the world needs to know what is happening. So uh, you're free to express it as, as you view. We're not in China. As mentioned earlier, um, we were women have been experiencing uh, horrific treatments and treated, um, I can't even put words into it. Um, with with the stories that I've heard from uh, dozens of women that I've interviewed, denied food denial, water denial, interrogations, um, uh, just detentions. Those are just the basics. Goes what goes beyond that? It's sexual abuse and violence from electronic sticks in their private parts, and rape, and reports of gang rape. Um, and also one woman that I uh, that I interviewed who had worked in a so-called re-education camp told me that she was required to bring women in chains to a room where they were raped by male guards, and she had to do this repeatedly. Waterboarding, tiger chairs, handcuffing, hood um, kicking, beating, bruising, just a normality for them. And on top of that, women also go through forced sterilization where um, 
Uyghur women were reporting forced placement of IUDs. Women also released from the camps have reported they have been forced to consume unknown medications that stop their menstrual cycles. And I believe this is an attempt to reduce the Uyghur population through reproductive uh, coercion. Mm -hmm. And that links to the, the first question. And uh, on top of that, outside of the camps as, camps, as I mentioned, that we were, women were forced to be wedded to the Han Chinese men. And each Han Chinese man can be rewarded 50,000 yuan for this interracial marriage. And every interracial child be born, they can also receive a certain amount of money as rewards as well. There are ads on the internet advertising how beautiful, beautiful and exotic Uyghur women are promising that they're ready to marry Han Chinese men. And this kind of exploit, exploitative advertising attempts to encourage Han Chinese men to populate the Uyghur region with the promise of a beautiful bride and the satisfaction of serving the national interest of synthesizing uh, the next generation. So they're thereby advancing the government's project to dilute the Uyghur identity in every possible way. Uh, earlier, as uh, Ms. Roya Hakankian, yes, good. I'm so sorry, no um, mentioned that uh, women in Iran was forced to, t uh, to keep their hijab on and they would be targeted when they have a few strands of hair showing. It's the opposite issue in the Uyghur region. For wearing a hijab, you get persecuted. For wearing a long dress on the streets, you, there, there will be police um, uh, patrolling and cutting off your dresses to make it short. Women are targeted in Uyghur region in every way. And because of uh, the targeting of those Uyghur women, the Uyghur identity have been threatened as well. And maybe you never know that in 10 years, I might be the last Uyghur person you know who speaks fluent Uyghur, who reads and writes her language. I learned my mother tongue in the United States, which is very ironic because I did not have the chance to do, do so in my homeland. Mm. And, and that is why that is very threatening and we Thank have to do something about you. it. Senator Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks to each of you for your powerful testimony. Um, Ms. Hakakian, uh, I know that uh, the chairman would have gotten to you if he had had more time, um, but I'm going to start with, with you to give you a chance to tell more about your story. Mm -hmm. We were told that after the regime's morality police killed this young woman, 22-year-old Masha Amini last week, uh, and killed her for not wearing her headscarf in the proper way, uh, that widespread protests have broken out across the country, protesting the regime and the oppression of citizens, particularly women. We've seen videos here in the United States of hundreds, maybe thousands of people protesting. And in a way, it's very inspiring uh, to see courageous women tearing off their headscarves and burning them as a sign of protest. Um, have you ever seen anything like this before in, in your experience? Uh, do you think these protests will continue? Do they have sustainability? Uh, and will they have any impact on the regime, if so? Um, I have seen a lot of protests in Iran. There are ways in which this last round of protests are very different from anything before. Um, one central way is that there is no negotiation with the regime anymore. In the past, there was the hope of a reformist movement or change. All that is done. In the past, the supreme leader would never be the target of the anger of the demonstrators. All that has changed. It is the very notion of the supreme leader that the people are objecting to, and it is the foundation of the system that that these demonstrators on the streets are targeting. These are the new features that we have almost never seen in previous demonstrations. Another thing that really uh, makes clear how this has changed is that the people seem to be ready to take on the security forces and, and riot police that is attacking them on the street. 
um, in the past, you know, a few, if, if the show of a few riot police would force people to run away. They would shoot and people would run away. Um, and, and that has changed also. People are, uh, you know, learning to come together to force them out of their cars um, and beating them in, in many videos that I've seen. Um, I think uh, it, this is a very important uh, moment in some ways because um, women are at the forefront and the most important slogan, as I mentioned, is life, liberty, and woman. And this is another thing that uh, not only brings this whole thing much closer to uh, any democratic vision that I've seen articulated on the streets, but also uh, I think a very important moment for the people in general. Just quickly, how can the U.S. play a constructive role here? Over the years, as you said, there have been protests. We have been told that the, the more the United States government is viewed as being helpful, the, least, uh, the less helpful it is, in, in effect. Uh, this needs to be homegrown and it needs to be one, uh, which it is, which is totally unrelated to uh, Western powers, book the United States. Uh, what's your view on that? And what do you think, if anything, the United States and your other um, European and, and for that matter, Middle Eastern countries that want to try to be helpful mm -hmm. um, can do? What else can people do? Um, well, I think the, the, the time that you know we made the argument that if people if the united states or europe intervene in iran you know um they take the agency away from the nation i i think that's behind this the nation is showing great agency um doing what they're doing at the moment um so the question uh, is what can be done first of all um in a in a world where there's such advanced technology available we have to make sure that the regime can't shut down the internet. It is a vital sor source of communication um, for the people within the country and access to the information beyond Iran. Um, the regime easily, readily uh, shuts down the internet and that's also a way for them to cut off the media from seeing what they're doing on the ground, which is incredibly dangerous and terrifying. Another thing that I think uh, ought to be done and, and can be done is to create a strike fund. Um, people are ready to do more, to sacrifice more um, by going on nationwide strikes. But um, there are no labor unions in Iran and there is no other fund to replace the lost salaries. So um, the question is, can we set up a strike fund to which um, the demonstrators can go in order to sustain themselves while, while they're striking against, uh, you know, in order to advance the cause. And, and lastly, it, you know, people are identifying the very individuals who are attacking them on the streets, who um, have ordered the killings. Uh, let's make sure that these people are on the sanctions lists because nearly all of the leadership of the Iranian regime have homes, estates, and family uh, in North America. And, you know, they come and go. Their children live here. And, and I want to make sure, I think we want to make sure, that um, these individuals lose access, um, you know, to, to both rule in Iran and also have their vacation time um, in our parts. Well, thank you. Those are all good suggestions, ensuring the internet is as open as possible um, mm -hmm. and through various ways. Uh, the strike fund idea, give people some sense that they'll have some way to feed their family should they should they choose to strike. And then the sanctions on the, a broader basis, particularly on, on individuals who are involved. Um, so many questions for all of you, but let me uh, jump, if I could, to uh, Ms. Paya Acevedo, uh, since 2014, the United States began normalizing relations with Cuba, as you know, and there was hope that re-engagement would have a positive effect, that there'd be more freedom in Cuba, that uh, somehow that would promote democratic change and more respect for human rights. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you your opinion as to whether you think that helped or not. 
Um, and then assuming you do not think it was very helpful, um, what else can and should be done from the U.S. perspective? Thank you so much for that for that question. I I think that more critical and louder than my opinion is the chanting of the people in the streets. The Cuban people is not chanting and the embargo is chanting freedom. The Cuban people are demanding libertad, patria y vida, which is homeland and life. And life is something that is repeated in the chantings across the citizenries that are demanding um, democracy, because that's the bottom of the issue, is our lives, the ones that are right now at the stakes. And that's something that the Cuban people knows very well. My country is on the brink of a humanitarian tragedy. Mothers cannot feed their children. There are no medicines. There are not expendable materials. There, are, there, is, there is no oil blackouts across the country, but when the people go into the streets, what we chant is freedom, because we understand that that's the root of the issue. Mm -hmm. We understand that to get out of the humanitarian crisis, we need to get rid of the dictatorship, and that's what you can help us with. And that's not, that's not and ask for you to do our job. No, the Cuban people is taking the higher possible risk, their own lives. But it's also, by doing so, providing a huge opportunity to the democracies of the Americas, and especially the US, to join that fight, to support that fight. And, and I think that there are very specific uh, actions that uh, the administration uh, and also using the tools that the Congress have created uh, can put in place in order to, to support the Cuban people that by the way is not only supporting the Cuban people, it's supporting peace and stability in the, in the, in the whole region. Um, first, please stop any, any attempt for appeasement. Instead, demand the liberation of the political prisoners, the human rights conditions from freedom of expression to association to economic freedom. Second, make full use of the Magnitsky Act mm -hmm. against Diaz Canel and all the top officials, but also against the judges and the prosecutors that I'm sending young people to eight years in prison because they film a protest in the streets. Third, create an international effort. United States, this country is the one that is called to lead that effort for solidarity with the Cuban people. Create a coalition of nations in support of the right to decide to, of the, for the Cuban people. The holding of, the, of, the, of a binding plebiscite for us to be able to choose the change towards democracy because what we want is free, fair, and multi-party elections that haven't taken place in my country Thank you. in more than 70 years. Thank you. I'm going to uh, turn to my colleague, Senator Kane. Uh, we have these votes, and so we're running back and forth to, to, uh, to vote. I know Senator Menendez will be back in a moment, uh, but I would like Senator Kane uh, to ask questions now. Thank you, Senator Portman, and thank you to the witnesses. Very, very powerful testimony. Um, Ms. Payal, one of the things I've noticed being on the Foreign Relations Committee is sometimes the hearings on this committee are maybe even more watched in other countries than they are here. That's not the case for the Commerce Committee. That's not the <laughs> case for the Health, Education, and Labor Pension Committee. But sometimes the issues that we spotlight in this committee, they get careful attention in other countries. And Cuba obviously controls the media environment pretty heavily, but citizens have a way of finding information. And so I, I hoped I might switch in Spanish for a second and have you offer a message to Cuban women. Entonces, por favor puede ofrecer un mensaje en español a las mujeres en Cuba que tienen sueños de un día de democracia y libertad en su país. Muchas gracias. Y mi mensaje a, a las mujeres cubanas es que no están solas. No estamos solas. Y que cuentan con todo el apoyo, con todo el apoyo de, 
las mujeres y los hombres cubanos que desde fuera de Cuba no vamos a parar hasta obtener la libertad. Especialmente a esas mujeres que no van a ver este mensaje porque están en prisión. A las más de 100 prisioneras políticas cubanas que han sido torturadas o que están en huelga de hambre como las hermanas Garrido. No están solas y lo vamos a lograr. Y, ex, y explico un poquito sobre las tres mujeres que están en un huelga de hambre ahorita en, en, en presión. Sí, son... I suppose that I switch English now. I, en, en, en español, porque yo creo hay, posiblemente hay gente en Cuba que no entiende la situación con ellos. Tres valientes mujeres cubanas, las hermanas Garrido, cada una de ellas madres de dos eh, adolescentes, y Lisandra Góngora, son de La Habana, de La Lisa, del pueblo donde es la familia de mi madre. Ellas están en prisión, condenadas a muchos años de cárcel por participar en las protestas del 11 de julio. Ellas se han negado a usar, a humillarse, a usar el uniforme que las obligan a usar en, eh, en la prisión y han empezado una huelga de hambre. El día de ayer pudieron enviar una nota escrita para que el mundo sepa que no se van a poner el uniforme, que empezaron la huelga de hambre, que su, única, su único consuelo en este momento es la Biblia y que desde una oscura prisión, desde una oscura sombra, como ellas mismas dicen, son la resistencia por la libertad del pueblo cubano. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Salam, I want to ask you, I know that you live in, in Arlington. We have a significant Uyghur population in Virginia, and one of the things that I'm troubled by is the degree to which authoritarian regimes not only crack down on populations at home, but even harass, in, in your case, Uyghurs who live here in the United States by threatening pressure against your family. Talk a little bit about the efforts that the Chinese government is using to harass Uyghurs outside of China. Thank you very much, Senator Kane, for raising this question. Many Uyghurs who thought they're finally safe after they left China are not actually safe. I personally was approached by Chinese students when I was living in Indiana back then in school, um, asking me to be careful with what I say, otherwise they will report me. Um, on social media, every day I see... Uh, dirty languages that I've never heard. I even have to Google Translate to know what it means. And um, and many Uyghurs have been followed. I've heard um, uh, Uyghur women, they had uh, people throw rocks t to their windows that it, it to the extent that uh, their windows broke. So, and, and we also know in Turkey, there were Uyghur men were uh, attacked. Um, um, Thankfully, he is alive and, and he, he's getting better. But um, uh, skipping China is not, not the end. That's why our effort together is very important. Our effort together to um, provide safe haven to, to make sure that uh, no matter which background you're from uh, in this country, you are free to speak up and your safety should not be um, um, the, cons uh, the reason that why you're afraid of testifying. And I would like to note that there are uh, currently over 1,000 um, uh, camp survivors in Kazakhstan, many of whom who are willing to testify only if they can be uh, transferred to a country where their camp feel, sa feel safe. We could have much more evidence, testimonies that than we currently have if there are countries who can be willing to accept them and provide them with uh, status. One of the things I want to just say as I hand it back to the chair is just the um, this issue of feeling like you're in the United States, so finally you can feel free to speak your mind. But if you're at risk here or you're worried about your family in China being persecuted because of your own activities, that's a heavy exactly. burden to carry. Exactly. And that's something that we need to think about and, and providing the kind of safe haven that you suggest. So I want to thank the witnesses for testimony and Mr. Chair, I will trade places with you as I go as I go vote now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you for presiding. Uh, entiendo que hubo una conversación larga en español aquí. Hmm. You're practicing your Spanish on my time, is that it? 
<laughs> I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to get her to give a great clip that might bring hope to some people who would want to watch it in their own language. Pero right. se necesita preguntar a los otros si ellos, ellas quieren uh -oh. hablar en su lengua también. Ah, uh ah, -oh, uh -oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate your chance. I just want to... And I'm sorry, I had, we we have votes on the floor on the on the uh, this treaty, so it's uh, uh, had to step out. But um, have you experienced? I, I think uh, you have the transnational reach of countries trying to affect your advocacy on human rights, and if so, in what way? And and what do you think? the United States should be doing about that? I open up that question for anyone. Well, yes, I can begin. Um, first of all, before I get to your question, I just wanted to say that I find it fascinating that uh, we're all connecting the dots, global dots, mm. because uh, Ms. Acevedo just a little bit before said that the people in Cuba aren't asking for the embargo to end, they're asking for freedom. And I should echo that because the people in Iran are not asking for the JCPOA to succeed or continue. They're not asking for the sanctions to be lifted. They are asking for freedom, liberty, and freedom of women. Um, so I don't know exactly how these themes come across all the way um, from the oceans to here for, for our policymakers to hear these messages. But sometimes nations are willing to undergo great difficulties in order to reach the sort of life that we have uh, modeled uh, in, our, in our tradition for them and for the liberty that they deserve. So um, I just want to say that uh, we're all echoing uh, some of the same sentiments. Um, and, and to that effect, I, I should also add that uh, every time the demonstrators, uh, I suppose in, in Cuba too, do not succeed, these regimes are strengthened um, because they uh, eliminate some of the key leaders, uh, but they also create the kind of fear that keeps people back from trying to do what they had done again. So it's, it's really critical that when they pour to the streets in such numbers and sacrifice to the degree that people are sacrificing in Iran now, that they are able to reap the benefits of their valor. Um, I have to say that um, every time that, that they don't succeed, uh, the regime has proven to have become more strengthened. Um, I came to America 30 plus years ago Back then, uh, there was no uh, footprint. There was no uh, sign of uh, the regime or its sympathize sympathizers in America. Uh, that has drastically changed. Um, as some of you may know, the FBI visited me three years ago at my home. It was a story that I only wrote about a few months ago, um, just to say that, that they had the uh, information that I was under the threat, and I am one of hundreds of dissidents and writers and intellectuals, um, th one of thousands around the world who are experiencing such threat. But what was most shocking to me um, was that they are here and they have never been. And, and the message that I want to communicate is that if they are here for us today, they will be here for the rest of you later. So the fact that they have created a footprint in this country um, is the beginning of, of I think, um, some, some very bad um, uh, pattern that they have managed to establish, which I think we should do everything in our power to, to undo because it will not end with dissidents. Anyone else wants to share? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Please. I'll share you. Yes, it is a very, very important question because we see the Cuban regime as the Berlin Wall of our hemisphere. 
the fact that uh, that the democratic world has tolerated for 60 years a dictatorship in Cuba has provoked the end of the democracy in Venezuela, the repression in Nicaragua. All of us know about the great influence of the Cuban regime in the rest of Latin America. I have been detained in Lima, Peru, because an order of the Cuban state security. That's the degree of influence that they have in this, uh, in this region. And they always, always use it to put peace, stability, and also the security of this country uh, in danger. So if I can make one ask here is for the US and the democracies of the Americas, but actually the democracies of the world to support the fight of the Cuban people for freedom. Because democracy in my country is essential to give this region a chance for peace, for security, for stability, and for justice. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to add, um, first I'd like to um, reiterate the importance of uh, uh, expedited refugee status for Uyghurs who are seeking asylum. And also, um, I'd like to go back to the Uyghur Force Saber Prevention Act that was uh, passed a few months ago in the US. Um, I'd like to note that we always welcome the passage of this law and everybody's extremely happy, but this does not mean the happy ending yet. The US citizens are still forced to be in some way unknowingly complicit in the rights abuse of the Uyghur people, um, because not only, uh, oftentimes when we think of forced labor, we link to textile industry, like the clothing that we're wearing, but the forced labor goes beyond to different sectors from solar to PVC materials, to electronics from our phones, to camera in this room, the tile in this very room, they could be all tainted by Uyghur forced labor. And earlier, Mr. Hakakian uh, mentioned about um, rights and choice and i in, in my in my definition of democ uh, democracy that's what it is um rights and choice and because of the uh, those products that are coming in from china or indirectly coming in uh from china whether through third countries and into the united states border that is leaving americans no choice and no rights to choose to shop from uh, ethically made uh, goods. So I, I really like to suggest the U.S. government to fully into, uh, implement and enforce the Uyghur Force Labor Prevention Act and also ensuring that goods export, exported from all countries are scrutinized, uh, not just those exported from the Uyghur region and from other parts of China. Um, it is... Um, uh, it is known that the Chinese uh, companies have been shipping their products to nearby countries, especially the largest garment producing countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Indonesia, and reshipping it into the United States or other countries, nearby countries like Canada and, and uh, EU. So it's, 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 uh, I would like to emphasize the importance of implementation of the, the, the most wonderful We Were For Saber Prevention Act. Thank you. Uh, Senator Portman has a final question. So. Yeah, let me just, if I could, follow up on that for a moment. Um, Ms. Ilham, you talked today about how um, Uyghurs and Muslims have been detained in these so-called re-education camps. Uh, you talked about the fact they haven't been accused of any credible crime, but, but just the fact that they are Uyghurs. And uh, you talked about forced sterilization, sexual assaults, uh, family separation, forced labor. Of course, many countries around the world, including the United States, have rightfully labeled this as, as genocide against the Uyghur people. You obviously have a very personal connection here, and your story with your father is a, is a powerful one. I know that uh, together you have played a key, a key role in um, trying to address this issue. Twenty percent of the world's cotton comes from Xinjiang, as I understand it. Twenty-four percent, even higher. Um, so it's, it, uh, apparel is a huge issue, and you were just talking about the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. It was, I think, uh, primarily focused on apparel at first, but as you say, it's about all kinds of forced labor. And you talk about the transshipment issue, where it would go from China to another country and then come in. And that's clearly one that uh, needs work. 
And uh, I, as a former U.S. trade representative, that's not just with regard to this issue, but a lot of other Chinese products that are subject to trade sanctions coming in from a different country uh, to avoid those sanctions. But how about the issue of suppliers? Uh, is that also something that you're concerned about? In other words, that people could be buying products um, that might not even be viewed as made in China because the, the Chinese supplier from Xinjiang province is a smaller part of the total value. But how do you get at that issue? It seems to me that might be the next step also in the uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act is to ensure that companies are not sourcing from uh, Xinjiang and then sending to the United States to to avoid the, the sanctions. Have you thought about that and whether there's a way to address that? Um, definitely, that's why the coalition that I'm working for, we have been calling on companies to disclose, uh, f to, to have full transparency on their to their raw material levels mm -hmm. because a lot of brands, a majority of the brands actually do not disclose that information or fail to do that because they have not been doing so since the beginning. But um, most of those multi-million, uh, billion uh, uh, corporations are more than financially capable of doing that. It's just a matter of will. Um, that's why we need the assistance of the U.S. government to put that uh, pressure uh, towards the corporations. They are cap capable of doing that to disclose that um, uh, where they're sourcing from, where they're supply, uh, where, who are their suppliers. It can be very complicated with the subcontractors, and um, um, but that is because those brands have not chose to do the ethical way since the beginning because they wanted to be profiting more. Um, it's it's um, now with the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, we have seen a significant um, change, shift in the industry. Just uh, the last um, st statistic I've, I, I, I've read was that compared to last June, this June's uh, 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 Xinjiang Cotton's gin sale ha has, has dropped nearly 40% uh, compared to last June. So that means that it is uh, impacting the industry, and many companies have been shifting their supply chain uh, to, uh, towards uh, either other parts of China or getting out of uh, China completely. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I thank um, all three of you for your testimony today and for your courage every day. And we have many more questions. We may do some follow-up uh, written re requests for information. Uh, but meanwhile, um, Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've been rejoined by Senator Shaheen, who um, is probably the most um, clarion voice on this committee on behalf of uh, women internationally uh, and uh, their rights, uh, as well as uh, the leadership roles they take. So, Senator Shaheen. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to you and Ranking Member Portman for holding this hearing today. I'm disappointed that more of the members of the committee weren't here to hear from all of our witnesses and to hear your eloquent testimony today. And thank you both for being here and for the work that you do every day to support women. Um, Mr. Chairman, it, it also speaks to why we need to have a fully functioning Office of Global Women's Issues. Um, I'm not sure that each of our panelists know that in our State Department, we actually have a separate office to address global women's issues because, as you all have pointed out, the challenges that women face in so many countries, whether it's authoritarian or developing countries, is often, it's certainly different than men, and often it's much harder. And to have a lens in our foreign policy that says we're going to look specifically at the challenges that women face in these countries and see how we can be more supportive, I think is really important. And Mr. Chairman, I know you agree with me, but that's why we need to have the head of our Office of Global Women's Issues appointed so that that office can engage with all of you and the women that you talked about today in their efforts, whether it's in Cuba or China or um, Iran, to respond to the authoritarian repression that women are facing. 
So I, I thank you very much and will continue to do everything I can. Um, one of the things that the chairman didn't point out is that I'm the only woman on this committee. <laughs> so um, your voices are particularly helpful. One of the initiatives that we have in the United States that you may be aware of is something that we call the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda that is designed to try and ensure that women are represented in negotiating conflicts around the world. Can each or whoever would like to speak to why it's important to have women at the table when we're negotiating in conflict areas and the, the different perspective that women bring? Well, um, I, I can I can, I can uh, cite examples of uh, what women have done uh, in yes. order to, and for instance, enter uh, soccer stadiums in Iran, um, which you know sounds laughable to the rest of us uh, because you know we shouldn't be living in 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 a world where uh, fifty percent of the population is not allowed to watch a game. It it just sounds uh, incredibly absurd. Um, but it, it has been women who have basically convinced um, the other 50% of the population that all things are much better when they're included. Um, it is now, you know, back in 1979, um, women were alone on the streets of Iran. It's even on March 8th of 1979, only uh, 20 days after the Iranian revolution had succeeded, um, when women took to the streets to march on the Women's Day, Universal Women's mm -hmm. Day, um, men were not along with them. So it's taken 40 years and a lot of peaceful activism on the part of women consistently to bring along 50% of the other of the of the population and convince them that a society cannot be whole if all its members are not equal and i think that's a huge achievement so the regime hasn't fallen that's true but a, a fundamental change has taken place thank you would either either of our other witnesses like to speak to that issue i know some you addressed it somewhat in your testimony I actually just want to share a little anecdote. Um, many uh, uh, people who are aware, uh, who are familiar with my work, know that I have not uh, been speaking out on the Uyghur people in general. Not until 2019, early beginning of 2019. Before that, I was fully advocating on the release of my father, uh, as you may, uh, as you know, that my father was sentenced mm -hmm. to life. But it was one woman's testimony that impact that was that was so impactful to, to me and and I also wrote that in my book as well she she is a mother of a tr uh, th uh, three children uh, she birthed triplets and she brought her triplets newborn triplets back to um, back to our homeland to let them visit the grandparents she was uh, arrested at the airport the moment she landed her children were ripped uh, off her 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 arms she was uh, she was arrested for nine months during her detention during the times when she spent in the camp one of her triplets were killed when she was in the camp she debated several times after she was released after she was able to leave the country she debated debated several times whether she will speak up it was she was so courageous because she had to choose between her parents' safety or her children's safety. She said, in order to build a future for my children, I have to speak up in order to build so many uh, a future for so many children just like mine, for them to be safe. I need to speak up. And she was one of the very first uh, victim that testified. Without her, um, we, we, the United States wouldn't uh, have been able to declare the genocide. Many countries, uh, including the most recent the UN report, would not have uh, been able to use uh, uh, 
um, not been able to start their investigations because of her. And she also, uh, I met her the first two weeks of her arrival, uh, the very uh, beginning of her arrival. And it was her that influenced me that I should not be afraid of the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. And I should not only speak on one person's case. It's not only about one person or one family. It's about hundreds of thousands. It's about the Uyghur people. It's about the Americans. It's about the entire world. It's about the humanity. So I, I think we should not underestimate women's power and a mother's power, and someone who has great love for the humanity. I, 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 I really, I just, just this anecdote I would like to share with you all. Thank you for that, Ms. Paya. Did you want to add anything to that? I, I believe it's just, it's, it's just a, such an obvious issue that is unbelievable that is still an issue. I mean, the, the topic is not complete if you don't have the women perspective, period. The, the, the women in Cuba, they're not only about advancing freedom. For instance, there is a very important and hard topic in my country. The military service is mandatory. When, when male get to the age of 17, 18 years old, they are sent to pretty much forced labor camps. And, and many of them don't even make it. The ones that are championing the cause of a stop this mandatory military service are their mothers, are the women. Are the women that are even speaking for men in Cuba. So I, I, I believe that, uh, that we should always be in the table, just at the same level. Thank you all so much for your eloquence and your courage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Senator Shaheen may be the only woman on the committee, but she is not the only voice for women on the committee. We join her uh, in that effort, but she is clearly a champion, and she reminds us uh, very vividly uh, in every opportunity she can, and she does a fantastic job of riveting our attention in that regard, and, and of course, all the members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> with the thanks of the committee for your testimony, there will be questions that will be submitted for the record because of the votes and other things that are going on. I know there are people who are going to be interested in your views. I would urge you when you get an opportunity to respond to those questions because they'll be part of the record. Uh, with the thanks of the committee, this record will be remain open to the close of business tomorrow, and this hearing is adjourned.